So, uh, some of you may know that about a month ago, the Owens and Potoshniks took a trip uh, to Europe where Matt and I ran in the Berlin Marathon. Uh, it's great. If I haven't told you about it and you want to know more, I can tell you more about it. If you don't want to know about it, it's okay. I don't have to, I'm going to tell you a little bit more now, but you know. Um, so, it was just the adults that went on this trip. Uh, we had a really beautiful race day. Uh, it was long, it was hard, but it was great. Uh, we spent first a couple of days in Prague and then uh, the rest of the time in Berlin. So it was only the second time that I had traveled to Europe. Uh, Aaron and I, for our 10th wedding anniversary a number of years ago, um, went to Europe. Uh, and I must say that I had forgotten how grueling traveling across time zones can be. We were seven hours ahead of Chicago time. So the journey started for us on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we left about 4 p.m. We took an eight and a half hour flight to Frankfurt. We landed local time, Frankfurt, Germany. It's like 7.20 a.m. Of course, it felt like 12.20 a.m. And I don't know about you, but I never sleep on planes. So maybe I was going on like an hour of sleep then we get on another flight and we travel to Prague. We land in Prague. It's 11.15 local time, a.m. So, you know, it's like almost lunch, uh, but it feels like 3.15 in the morning. We get to the hotel and as much as I wanted to go to sleep, you know, it's daytime. And so you gotta get out, you gotta drink coffee and get in the sunlight. Don't go to sleep. Now, Nicole had this rule which I kept breaking. And the rule was, we're not allowed to talk about what time it is at home. So, you know, we're having lunch, and I'm thinking and talking about, you know, it's 4 a.m. back home, and I would be in bed sleeping right now. And it probably would have been helpful if I would have listened to her rule, uh, because it's just not helpful when you're in Prague, and it's beautiful, and the sun is shining, and you're eating a croissant and having coffee or something to talk about how it's really like 4 a.m., that's what we're all feeling. Um, there's something about that experience that I think helps us to understand that this passage that we just read, and what is true of someone who believes in Jesus and, and is a Christian. When, when someone believes in Jesus, they are transferred from one realm of existence to another. To use the language that Paul uses in other places, a person who believes in Jesus has been transferred from a king, one kingdom to another, from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light. When a person believes in Jesus, they're united to Jesus by faith, by the work of the Holy Spirit, and this union with Jesus, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, Christians have been raised up with Jesus and seated with him in the heavenly places. That through this union with Jesus, a Christian is part of the new creation, the new creation that began when Jesus raised from the dead. Through union with Jesus, a Christian has been transferred, not on an airplane, to a new country and a time zone, but by the Spirit, the core us, our truest identity, has been moved. It's been transferred from this world and this age to the age to come and the new creation when God will bring the fullness of that when Jesus returns. And we could say this spiritual jet lag is incredibly disorienting. Because if you're a Christian, you've experienced this move in one sense, this realm transfer, and yet you still live in this world, this world of brokenness and suffering and sin and death, a, a world that doesn't acknowledge God as central to life. And so this world has its own way of making life work apart from God. To use the language of the passage we just read, if you're a Christian, you belong to the day. The day when Jesus will return and bring the fullness of God's kingdom and new creation. And that has already started and we've already begun to experience it. You belong to the day when you believed, you woke up 
to that future day, and yet you live in a world that's sleepwalking when it comes to God and what he's doing in Jesus. And not only that, but we still experience temptation, desires that would pull us, lull us back to sleep, to the most important reality and to who we really are. This morning, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14 in particular. So if you have your bulletin out, that would be really helpful. If you look at those verses in your bulletin, you'll see the first sort of half of this passage. So from verse 11 through the first half of verse 12, it tells us something that is. Paul keeps referring to what time it is. He writes, besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. But then the second half of verse 12 through the end of 14, Paul tells us how we are to respond to this reality. So then, he says, because of what time it is, because of the hour, because of that, therefore, this is how you should respond. This is what you should do. So this morning, I want us to think about these two parts of our text. The first, I'm going to say this, the gospel tells us something, and that is that history has forever been changed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then second, the gospel calls us to respond and to live awake to the dawn of salvation in Jesus. So first, the gospel tells us something. History has forever been changed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. This, this first part, verse 11 through the first half of 12, Paul really gives here the reason why we should listen and do pretty much everything that he's been saying since chapter 12. Everything we've looked at and considered this fall in our study of Romans. Verse 11 and the first half of 12 tell us why we sh should listen to the call to love, why we should relate to the government the way that Paul instructed us, why we should be active in participating in the church, the body of Christ, why we should live these lives of giving our whole selves to God. And it's because of the time that we're in. We are living in the time when God's kingdom and new creation is breaking into this world through Jesus. When many of us, I think, think of the gospel, our minds almost immediately go to the gospel is the good news of Jesus, and we think about what that means for us. That Jesus' death and resurrection means that we can be forgiven of our sins, and we can be made right with God. We can be saved, and we can know that we will be with God forever, and, and that's true. But first and foremost, the gospel is good news that tells us something that God has done in history. That the world and history has forever been changed because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. That something decisive has happened that cannot be undone. That in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the trajectory of history changed because a new age has dawned this new age of God's kingdom and new creation. Now, if that language sounds strange, uh, th think about how we can use language of ages to talk about history. So whether you think about like the Bronze Age, or the Iron Age, or the Industrial Age, we're talking about major shifts that happened in history where life and the trajectory of how life was lived Society and civilization were changed. And that is what the gospel is telling us, that this good news of Jesus is about this new age that has broken into the present. And it is a monumental claim. You know, it was about two years ago, around Easter time, that the New York Times had an opinion piece where they interviewed a New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright, uh, a prolific New Testament scholar, Anglican priest. He's written extensively on many topics having to do with the Bible. 
one of his largest works is an 800-page book on the resurrection of Jesus. I own it. I have not read it. All of it. I've read parts of it. In this book, he looks at the New Testament documents as well as other writings from around that time. And he looks into the details of, of what people believed about the afterlife, as well as making a historical case for the resurrection of Jesus. There are few people who have done more work in this area. And in this New York Times interview that, that's interesting, he says many interesting things. One of the things that just caught me, and I love the way he put it, he basically says at one point, look, it's not like people in the first century didn't know that dead people stay dead. This is what he says. Early Christianity was born into a world where everybody knew that its central claim was ridiculous, and the early Christians knew it themselves. This claim seemed absolutely crazy. Ordinary, sober people knew perfectly well that dead people don't get raised up again. Many Jewish people believed that in the end, all God's people would be raised because they believed that the God of Israel, the Creator God, would remake the world. But the gospel message is about Jesus, one person being raised ahead of all the others. In the non-Jewish world, there is no evidence that anyone is expecting dead people to come back again. Most people knew that when you died, that was basically it. That's why Paul, when he's in Athens, said that this had happened, most of them laughed at him. It didn't fit their worldview. That's crucial because you can't fit the resurrection into existing worldviews we've got. The resurrection brings its own worldview with it and says, if you're going to understand the way things are, you start with this and you work out. If Jesus really has been raised, then everything is different. And that's what Paul's doing here in this passage. He's reminding these Christians in Rome, look, Jesus has already won. He's been raised from the dead. He is the true Lord and ruler. The next event on God's clock, the next event in the history of salvation is the return of Jesus, where he will do away with all evil and bring judgment on those who have turned away from God. And then salvation will be experienced in all of its fullness for those who have trusted in Christ, and the world will be renewed. In another one of his writings, N.T. writes is this, we could cope, the world could cope with a Jesus who ultimately remains a wonderful idea inside his disciples' minds and hearts. By this, he means it, the world would be fine with a Jesus who's just this nice religious idea for people who like to think about religion and that kind of stuff. But then he goes on to say, the world cannot cope with a Jesus who comes out of the tomb and inaugurates God's new creation right in the middle of the old one. But that's exactly what the gospel tells us. That history has been changed because of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what Paul is preaching all over the Roman Empire. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is what Jesus is preaching. And this is what Jesus is demonstrating through his miraculous works. Jesus preaches, he says, much like Paul in this passage, turn and wake up because God's kingdom is drawing near through me. That's what he's preaching. And then he goes around and he's doing things like healing people and defeating evil and forgiving sin and giving life to the dead. You see, it's like when Jesus is near, God's kingdom and new creation breaks into these little parts of the world, into people's lives. There's life instead of death. There, there's wholeness instead of sickness and brokenness. And there's a particular event in Jesus' life that I've, I've always found moving, and perhaps it's because I'm a dad. Um, perhaps it's also because I still to this day remember a sermon that I listened to by Tim Keller on this passage. It happens in Mark chapter 5. And there's this man named Jairus who comes to Jesus, and he falls at Jesus' feet. 
and begs Jesus to come with him because his daughter is dying. And so Jesus goes with Jairus. But as they are traveling, people come from the house and say, we don't have to bother Jesus anymore because she's already gone. And Jesus looks at Jairus and he says, do not fear, believe. And he goes into the house where the child is lying and Jesus takes this girl by the hand and he says to her in Aramaic, Talitha kumi, which is the sort of thing that, you know, a loving parent, a mom or a dad, would say to their child to wake them up from a nap. Jesus comes to this girl who is dead, and he takes her hand. And in essence, he says to her, honey, it's time to get up. And he brings her back to life. He reaches into death and he brings her back. And that's what the Son of God is doing when he took on humanity and he invaded this broken world. That's what he's bringing, the life of new creation, where there's no longer sickness and cancer, where there's not sin and evil, where there's not suffering. See, this is what Jesus, God in person in our world, was doing through his life through his death, through his resurrection. He was bringing life into the world, and he has won. And the day is coming where the fullness of his salvation is going to dawn, and it's going to come to all who have trusted in him, and it's going to fill the whole earth. And now is the time to wake up. God, in his loving mercy in the gospel, says to you this morning, Honey, it's time to wake up. Some of you are here and you do not know Jesus. You have not turned to him. You've not received him and what he's done for you. The good news of God in the gospel to you this morning is his love and mercy saying, Honey, it is time to wake up. It's time to come into the light. It's time to turn away from the darkness, to become a child of the light. It's time to turn away from the way of being a human being where God is functionally irrelevant, where you're trying to make your life work on your own, on your own terms, where you're trying to control, where you're trying to take the the hurt and the brokenness and the pain in your life and you're trying to heal it by your own ways and your own methods rather than coming to Jesus and finding his mercy and his grace. It's time to wake up. Many of us are here and and we believe in Jesus and perhaps we've been followers of Jesus for many years. In his love, he says to you again this morning, honey, bud, it's time to wake up. It's time to stay awake to me. Salvation is near. This is what the gospel tells us. History has forever been changed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the gospel calls us to respond to this news. This is what we see in the rest of the text. Because of the time, verse 11, and the hour, and the nearness of salvation, because the night and the darkness is moving toward its final stage and the day has come near, therefore, so then, this is how we ought to respond. We are to respond by Casting off, putting off, and we are to respond by putting on. Let's think first about the casting off. Notice how Paul describes what we are to cast off. Verse 12, he describes this way of life as the works of darkness. In other words, there there are ways of living that are opposed to this coming day we've been talking about in the first half of the passage. And then in verse 14, he refers to this way of life with the term flesh, when he says, we are to make no provision for the flesh. And here we come back to something that we've seen many times in the book of Romans, if you've been with us. You'll remember, when Paul is talking about flesh, he's not talking about the body. He's not anti-body. Flesh, as we've said throughout Romans, 
This is the it's up to me way of life. It's a way of life that humanity entered into when we first turned from God in the beginning, when we sought to make life work apart from Him. It's the way things are in the world, where the world goes about life oblivious to God, where God is irrelevant, where humanity in the flesh says, we make it work. We figure it out. We control. It's up to us. The specific things that Paul mentions in verse 13, what we're not to do, these things are characteristic of the flesh. They come from the way of life and the logic that it's up to me. I know what's best for me. I figure out life my way. The three pairs that Paul mentions in verse 13 are not exhaustive. If, if you looked at other places in the New Testament or in even Paul's letters, some of these would be mentioned, but then others would be added in. For example, look, greed. This list is not exhaustive, but it names uh, examples of this life in the mode of the flesh. Life lived in darkness to God. Look, just briefly, let's consider the examples he gives. The first pair, orgies and drunkenness. This is a life, uh, when I was doing campus ministry, uh, I would regularly hear the term YOLO. Do we, uh, we all know what YOLO is? You only live once. This is the party life. A life of excess food, drink, a life to feel good, to have a good time, to escape pain and brokenness in your life through <coughs> feasting, through partying, through substances. The, the second pair, sexual immorality and sensuality. This is a life that lives for sexual fulfillment. It's a life that rejects God's boundaries and good gift of sex given in the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Whether, whether we're talking about something like pornography or, or promiscuity or even engaging in sex but not willing to bind one's life to another in the covenant of marriage. This is the logic and way of life that says, well, this is how I do it. This is what's best for me. This is what makes me happy, and I'm not really concerned what God or Jesus says about it. The, the last pair, quarreling and jealousy. This, this is a life of fundamental disharmony with others. Fighting. Envy. This and things like these, we must cast off. We can't continue in this way of life, in the flesh, living in darkness, lights out to God. Paul says in verse 14, make no provision for the flesh, meaning don't plan to meet the needs of the flesh. Remember, it's time to wake up. Don't give an inch on these things. We know, don't we, though, those times when we feel the pull of temptation, and we give an inch. We dip a toe. It's just a click. It's just this one little thing. It won't ever get serious. It's just this little part of my life. God doesn't really care about that. It's okay for me to hold on to bitterness. That person deserves it. Paul says, no. Don't feed the flesh. Cast off the works of darkness. Cast it off. And notice what he says in verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. It's not, okay, so now because Jesus has changed history, you need to, do, uh, you need to not do bad, and you need to do good. No, what does he say? He says, we are to cast off these ways of living so that we can put on a person is kind of a weird thing to say. But it's really beautiful because Jesus wants you, in a sense, to wear him, which is an incredibly close and intimate image. Re remember, being a Christian means that you've been united to Jesus. And one of the ways the Bible often talks about this is, is the union of marriage. <clears throat> it's like a marriage where, where two people, when they come together, their debts become collective debts. Their assets become collective assets. Only in this instance, we bring all the debt, and he brings the riches of his grace. And now the call is to live every day like you're married to Jesus. To live every day out of that union. 
To live every day putting into practice, reappropriating the reality that you belong to Jesus, to put him on afresh in every little part of life. Because he wants to be with you and he wants to lead you. He wants to lead you into the fullness of your humanity and what you one day will be. And let me even clarify that a little bit. It's so typical whenever we're reading the Bible. It's so easy to read all of this as if what Paul is saying here is, you individual need to cast off and you individual need to put on Jesus. But all of this is in the plural. So he's saying, we do this together, which is why we need the church. We need the community of God's people. We, we need each other. We need each other to stay awake. We need help to turn away from the darkness. We need each other. We need each other to put on Jesus and to live into the fullness of what it means to belong to Jesus together as his body. This is how we are to respond to the news that Jesus has won and history has been changed. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, um, I was in the office on a Friday. It was a late kind of Friday afternoon. I was wrapping up the day, checking email, that sort of thing. I came across this article in the New Yorker. It was an excerpt from Alexei Navalny's prison diary. Uh, Alexei Navalny, if you're not familiar with him, was a Russian political opponent of Vladimir Putin, who died in a Russian prison uh, this past February. Back in 2020, Alexei, uh, the opposition leader, was on a flight, and he thought that he was dying. His, he was disoriented, he felt like his whole body was shutting down. The plane made an emergency landing, and he was hospitalized. A few days later, he was taken to Berlin for treatment, and it was confirmed that he had been poisoned. As a result, he went into a coma. When he came out of the coma, he announced that he was going to return to Russia knowing full well what was going to happen. When he landed, he was arrested, he was brought up on false charges, and he was put in prison. So a few Fridays ago, I was planning to go home, and I just can't stop reading this diary. Here's a picture of a man who is trapped in the dark night of prison, suffering, persecuted by the state, because he dared to call the lies of a dictator. He's in one of the toughest prisons in Russia, up near the Arctic Circle, where it gets negative 26 degrees Fahrenheit. Each morning, he's forced to do this exercise where he walks about 11 paces back and forth because that's all the space that he's given. He's journaling, he's writing, with a strange sense of humor at times, a lightness and a peace. He talks some in this, in this diary about his faith in Jesus and the life that Jesus has called him to live. He references passages like the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus calls those blessed who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for things to be set right. He writes about his settled convictions about Russia, and one of his last entries was January 9th, 2024, slightly a month before he died in prison. And he journaled about how the present Russian state, the Putinist state as he called it, that it is only a matter of time before the current regime collapses because it's built on lies and it can't last. He writes, lies and nothing but lies. It will crumble and collapse. One day we will look at it and it won't be there. Victory is inevitable. And reading his words, I was just I was struck by his courage. Courage to face injustice, darkness, cruelty, and suffering, knowing that this can last. And I was reminded of this passage, because this is the kind of courage that we can have through Jesus. Because Jesus faced the ultimate darkness when he faced death and evil, when he went to the cross to win our forgiveness, that we might have life in his kingdom. Because Jesus went and died our death and was raised up into the new creation and we are in him, 
we can have this courage to know that the temptations will not last, that the suffering will not last, that the day is coming, that the way of life in this world where God is irrelevant and doesn't matter and what he says is stupid or it doesn't fit anymore or whatever, it's not going to last. It can't last because Jesus has been raised. He will free us from all of our sin and sorrow, and even now he is with us by his spirit. In light of all of this, let me call us to turn to a time of prayer. Each week we do this, where after hearing God's word, we turn and speak honestly to God in a time of silent prayer, confessing our sins, seeking God's grace, his mercy, his help. He calls us to do this, he delights that we turn to him. So let's spend a few moments in silent prayer and confession, and then I will close us. In